good evening. Today I'll be reviewing an old ultra-wide angle Tamron zoom lens which used to be very popular and is still widely available on eBay. The Tamron 17-35mm f2.8 to f4. It's from the film era so it's designed to give an ultra-wide angle on full-frame cameras although it will also function on APS-C cameras. It can be found for about £150, so this is the ultra-wide-angle cheap option for you, if you do own a full-frame camera. Here we go, 35mm and zooming out to 17mm. Nice. It was always a reasonably popular lens because of that wide-angle coverage, its low price and its brighter than usual maximum aperture of f2.8 to f4 which means it lets in quite a good amount of light and can give you more out-of-focus backgrounds. Sigma also made a 17-35mm f2.8-f4 to F4 lens at the time, but the Tamron was generally considered to be a slightly sharper lens, and so I decided to go ahead and look at this one instead. It has the typical build quality of an old-style Tamron lens. It's small and light, which is nice when you're travelling, but its build quality also feels quite cheap and plasticky. The zoom ring turns the opposite way from Canon lenses and not very smoothly either. The lens's front element extends and retracts as you zoom in and out. The focus ring works quite loosely, but it has quite a long travel path, allowing for precise focusing. You can only turn that ring when the lens is set to manual focus. Don't try to force it around when you're set to autofocus. That autofocus motor runs at an average speed and sounds remarkably like a Dalek sighing in disappointment about something. It's not a very loud noise though, thankfully. The autofocus accuracy was okay, hitting the mark most of the time when I was testing it. The lens comes with a nice hood and its filter thread size is 77mm. On the whole, it's a very cheaply made piece of kit, but the silver lining is that it's fairly small and light, handy for throwing into your camera bag for a day out. Let's look at image quality on a full frame camera, in this case a 20 megapixel Canon 6D. If we start at 17mm and f2.8, we see that picture quality in the middle of the frame is very nice and sharp, with quite good contrast. The corners of the image are another matter, being quite dark and very soft indeed, particularly in the extreme corners. Green and pink chromatic aberration is also visible on contrasting edges. Stop down to f4 for more brightness, but only a small improvement in sharpness. At f5.6 the corners noticeably pick up though, and at f8 the lens is sharp from corner to corner. That chromatic aberration is still quite visible though, unfortunately. Let's zoom in to 35mm now. Straight from f4, the image quality in the middle is sharp and punchy. However, the corners of the image quickly deteriorate, looking surprisingly weak. There's a little improvement at f5.6, and at f8 those corners are as sharp as you're going to get. So, on a full-frame camera, the lens really delivers in the middle of your images and kind of fails in the corners until you stop the aperture down pretty far. That's not really a very good thing for an ultra-wide-angle lens. You really want corner-to-corner -corner sharpness. There really is no point using this lens on an APS-C camera if you're thinking about it. Just get a fast standard zoom lens instead. Well, just in case you were thinking about getting this lens for your APS-C camera anyway, here are some test results on my 18 megapixel Canon 6DD. At 17mm in the middle of the image, we see some softness at f2.8. Over in the corners, actually, they're not much worse, although the colour fringing seems pretty bad. As you stop down the aperture, the lens slowly improves from f4 to f5.6, to f8, where the image is finally sharp. At 35mm and f4, again, the picture quality is evenly soft from the middle to the corners. Stop down to f5.6 for an improvement, but it's only at f8 that we really see acceptable image quality. So, on an APS-C camera, this lens has no clout and no meaning and should really be avoided. Moving on, 
Let's see about distortion and vignetting on a full-frame camera. At 17mm we see strong barrel distortion and heavy vignetting at f2.8. Stop the aperture down to f4 for, well, not much difference really, but at f5.6 that vignetting is a little more tame. At 35mm we see noticeable pincushion distortion and heavy vignetting again at f4. This time, stopping down has a greater effect, and at f5.6, the vignetting is gone. So, it's a bit of a weak performance for distortion and vignetting. Let's look at close-up image quality. The lens can focus down to about 29cm. Not great, but not bad either. At f4, the picture quality is surprisingly sharp, and at f5.6, you get a little extra resolution there too. Nice. My test for work against bright lights involves scientifically pointing the lens at the sun. Wow, that's pretty cool. What a lot of very complex flaring. It looks pretty, but technically all that flaring is a major weakness, particularly for an ultra-wide angle lens which will pick up the sun in its frame quite often. Finally, bokeh. On a full-frame camera, this lens can give you some reasonably out-of-focus backgrounds. That background bokeh looks quite neutral, being neither distracting nor particularly smooth. It looks a little nicer if you zoom in to 35mm, as you can see here. Well, overall, this lens is small, cheap, and kind of fun in a way. It'll get you some very nice shots if you're prepared to stop the aperture down to about f8. If you need an ultra-wide angle lens for your full-frame camera, and this is all you can afford, then you could indeed give it a punt. But really, its optical design is too old to truly compete these days, particularly on a high-resolution digital camera, so I wouldn't bother, personally.